And I want to read to you this morning two Bible verses actually written by the same person. I mean, all the Bible is written by the Holy Spirit, right? We understand that. But Paul wrote the book of Ephesians. Uh, he wrote a letter to the Ephesians, and he wrote to the Philippians. And I want to read first what he wrote to the Ephesians. It's all in God's Word, so this is the Word of God. Ephesians chapter 2, verses 8 and 9, familiar to most of you, says this, For it is by grace you have been saved through faith. And this is not from yourselves, it is the gift of God, not by works, so that no one can boast. So here's a question. Does salvation come by you doing good works? You can answer. It's not a trick question. No. Thank you for answering. Like, he's tricking me. I don't want to be embarrassed. <laughs> no, you're right. The answer is no. Yes, it's no. You are not saved by good works. The Bible's clear, and this is probably one of the clearest passages in the Bible that talks about that. Let me read another passage out of the Bible from Paul. Philippians chapter 2, verse 12. It says, Continue to work out your salvation with fear and trembling. Hmm. Continue to work out your salvation with fear and trembling. So what is it? I mean, are, are we working for our salvation or are we not? Because those two seem to compete a little bit. Well, here's a hint. It says work out your salvation. It doesn't say work for your salvation. And, and that's a hint. And let's just start with our main point today, and then we'll, we'll work from there. Here's the main point we're launching from today, and here it is. You don't work for your salvation. You work from it. You do not work for salvation, you work from it. In other words, your good works are not the basis for you being saved, but they should give evidence of you being saved. It's interesting that statistics show that most people who call themselves Christian, you know, whether they are or not, they, they least, at least they think they're a Christian, Statistics show that most of them believe that you have to sort of work for your salvation. You have to do some, some amount of good works to be saved. So there's that group, and it's a pretty sizable group who call themselves Christian. <laughs> but then there's another group, maybe not as sizable, but, but a significant number of people uh, who think, they don't need to do good, work, do good works because they're saved. It's like, oh, you don't do good works. We're saved by grace through faith. So we don't need to do good works. So there, there's, there's that group of people. But here's the problem. So among the people who call themselves Christian, there's like half of them that have the wrong motivation for doing good works because they think it's their way to get saved. And then there's another half that their motivation is to not do good works at all. Like there's no motivation to do good works. It's like, I'm saved, I'm going to heaven, put her in neutral, we're good. Um, that's, and that's a problem because neither one of those are right. So we're going we're gonna to find that sweet spot of truth, okay? We're not saved by good works, but we're supposed to work out our salvation. So obviously works have something to do with salvation, but the Bible tells us where the truth is. And remember this, you always, always, always need to interpret the Bible from the Bible. You don't interpret confusing things by what other people say or by what other people think. The Bible will interpret itself. So if you search it in the right context and with the help of the Holy Spirit, you'll find the answer. So we're going to look at some biblical truth today. I'm going to share three biblical truths regarding this, salvation and works, uh, then I'm going to share three uh, application points of how you can apply that to your life. So our, biblical, our three biblical, biblical truths all come from the same passage, and I read part of it just a minute ago. It's Philippians 2.12, but I'm going to add verse 13, and that's where we're going to get all our biblical truth from, and it, it will help you, I'm sure. Philippians 2.12, we read the first part, but I'm going to read 13. Continue to work out your salvation 
with fear and trembling. For it is God who works in you to will and to act in order to fulfill his good purpose. All right, remember that verse because that's where we're going to we're going to look at that here for the next few minutes. So here's, here's the first biblical truth from that. God wants you as a citizen of heaven, and if you're a believer, you're a citizen of heaven, to work to fulfill his purposes. It's not a prerequisite for your salvation. It's an expectation God has for those who are saved that you will actually be productive in the kingdom. You would actually help to advance the kingdom of heaven. Citizenship, of which you are a citizen of heaven, the Bible says, citizenship has responsibilities. I'm not really sure what they're teaching in civics and government now. I hope they're teaching good. I think our local schools here do a great job, so I'm sure they're doing a great job. I know in eighth grade civics, one of the first things I learned that as a citizen of the U.S., we have responsibilities, right? We have the responsibility to vote. We have the responsibility, some, to participate in government at some point. Uh, so we have responsibilities as, as good citizens. It's the same with the kingdom of heaven. We have responsibilities. Now, you don't have to do them. To st you're still going to be a citizen, but there's this sort of expectation that you would do that. And certainly... The U.S. needs good citizens, right? And the kingdom of heaven needs good citizens. Most of you know this, but it bears repeating. The church, which is the assembly of, of all of God's people, right? Ecclesia means assembly of the called out ones. The church, both local and, and universal, is the physical body of Jesus on this earth. Jesus is here spiritually, and he's in you, but his physical hands and feet are not here, but yet in a way they are because you have hands and feet. You are the hands and feet of Jesus. And, and when we gather as the body, as the church, as the ecclesia, we make up the physical body of Jesus. And our work, simply stated, is to make Earth look more like heaven. I know this isn't heaven. I know that. And I know there's a future time coming when we will experience the full expression of the kingdom of heaven. Will there be no more pain, no more death, no more sickness, uh, no more tears? It will, it's going to be a wonderful place. We're not there yet, okay? It's coming, and we will experience that. But there's still an aspect of the kingdom that is alive and active right now in believers who are citizens of heaven. And so we're, we're to work as citizens of the kingdom of heaven to make our spot on heaven and on earth look a little bit more like heaven. It's in the Lord's Prayer that we read earlier, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. So when we say, well, what work are we supposed to do for the Lord? making earth look more like heaven. It's, it's not hard. I, I, I'm not saying it's, it's not hard to understand. It's maybe hard to do, right? Because um, sometimes you don't think we're equipped. One of the reasons I think it, what makes it hard um, is that a lot of people either lack the desire to do that or they lack the energy. Like, honestly, like people like, I'm busy. I'm, I'm trying to make a living. I got kids or, you know, we got things. Or retired people, like you think they have the time. I'm hearing, and now that I'm not, I'm not retiring, I don't feel like I'm close to it, but I have retired friends who are like, I'm busier now than I was before. <laughs> right? Yeah, it's like, because like, hey, they're not busy. They're retired. Call them. Everybody's busy. Just ask them. You know, I, I don't, I don't hardly ever talk to anybody that, no, I'm not really all that busy. No, I, I can do that. <laughs> Sometimes that happens, but we're <laughs> like, no, I'm busy. And that's good. It's better than being bored. Um, but sometimes we lack that energy or maybe the time or the desire. But, but, but here's something awesome. And we read this in Philippians 2.13. Jesus 
can give that to you, both the desire and the energy, and that's actually point number two under the biblical truth, God will give you the desire and the power to work in his kingdom. That's what it says. It says in verse 13, he works in you to will and to act. The word act uh, in the original language of the New Testament, which is Greek, is in, inner gale. Inner gale is where we get our word energy. Energy. It's power. And so that's the word act. So when, when the Holy Spirit prompted Paul to write these words that God works in you to will and to act is to energize you, to empower you. It's safe to say that in the natural, it's like, I don't have the power to do that, whether it's energy or just like supernatural power. I don't have that. Right. That's why God has to give it to you. And he will, and this is just one of the many, many places God promises to do that. Um, it's the power to get things done. So when it says he works in you to will and to act, it's really he's giving you the power to get things done, whether it's energy, supernatural power, whatever it is, he'll give it to you. But he also, probably more importantly, <laughs> will give you the will to do it. Will would, uh, um, synonym would be um, desire or willpower. Right? When, whenever people talk about, especially dieting, oh, I'd love to do that, I just don't have the willpower. <laughs> um, maybe they have the desire, but the will, like, okay, I'm gonna actually do this. But God will give you that willpower. God will give you that desire. So, he wants you to work for his kingdom. He will give you the desire and the power to do it. But here's the third biblical truth. Salvation is more than going to heaven when you die. It's living a meaningful and productive life as a citizen of the kingdom of heaven here on earth. I grew up always going to church. I grew up in church. Um, we said, in the Lutheran church, we said the Lord's Prayer every Sunday. And I, I knew it because you just, when you were sitting there every week, you just, you just know it. You don't have to read it. You just know it. And at some point, I begin to think about the words, your kingdom come, kingdom at, and at that point, it was like, and actually, honestly, for a lot of years after, a lot of decades after that, was like, oh, that means when Jesus comes back. Okay, when Jesus comes back, then his will will be done here on earth. Okay, someday, yay, someday that's going to happen. I thought that's what that meant. It doesn't mean that. I mean, there, there is that aspect, like I talked about earlier, but, but we're to... Um, we're not just saved so we don't go to hell. Honestly, can I just be honest? That's kind of why I got saved at 10 years old. It's like, I was like, heaven doesn't sound all that awesome because I watch too much TV, like Three Musketeers commercials and fluffy, not stuffy, only old people remember that. And it was angels on clouds with harps eating Three Musketeers because it doesn't weigh them down. So they can, you know, fluffy, not stuffy. And so we get this, this caricature of heaven, like we're just in white robes, floating on clouds, playing harps, playing dull music. And it's like, but I guess that's better than burning in hell. So I guess I'll do the heaven thing. So, salve, so Jesus, save me. And that's, that's okay, I guess, right? I mean, it's true. It does save us from hell. Um, but salvation is so much more than just going to heaven when you die. It's, it's about living a productive and a meaningful life now, and that's when it says, work out your salvation with fear and trembling. It's like, we're called to do works now as saved people. So like I said earlier, we have to apply that. How, how do you apply that into your life? What does that look like? I've got three application points this morning. Here's number one. Ask the Holy Spirit. This is the hardest one, all right? So hold on. 
Ask the Holy Spirit to put the well-being of others ahead of your own desires. Uh, like that is so countercultural right now. That, that is probably one of the most unpopular statements <laughs> to be made <laughs> ever. It, in recent, I mean, because we're, we're taught, our culture is so me-centered, so I-centered. Um, let, me, let me read in Philippians. We're still in chapter two, but I'm going to go back a few verses about this idea of putting the well-being of others ahead of our own desires. Philippians chapter two, starting verse three, says, do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit. Rather, in humility, value others above yourselves, not looking to your own interests, but each of you the interests of others. I wonder how many worship songs will be written about that verse this year. Probably zero. I don't know. Maybe there are. If there are, we should sing that. Right? This is hard. It's hard because, number one, just by nature, we're, we're kind of self-centered, selfish people. Just by nature, we don't need culture to do that, but culture totally feeds into that. Culture, especially the last few years, like it's all about you. <laughs> um, but, but it's not just been lately. Paul was really putting his finger on a problem in the Philippian church. That's why he wrote this 2,000 years ago. They were doing well. They, they, were in a, they were actually, you know, had good churches and things seemed to be going well and, and people were economically doing okay. But he had to put his finger on a problem. It's like, you guys are only thinking about yourself, me. What about others? You got to think about that. That's important. Uh, a few weeks ago, actually probably a month ago, uh, Don and I were at, we were at Glacier Bible Camp for family camp. And uh, it's for all ages, all families come. And, and uh, in the morning, uh, they, have a, they had a speaker that was really good. Uh, Peter, can't think of his last name, pastor in Charlottesville, South Carolina. Great, great pastor. His son is a theologian, 28-year-old theologian, has his doctorate. And uh, he spoke just in a pastor's gathering earlier in the morning. And it, um, it was really, really good. And one of the things he spoke about uh, is this term modernity. If you're not familiar with that term, it's basically modernism, modernity, modernism, right? Modernism really reinforces the individual, that concept. It, it pushes individual freedom, individual comfort. And we like that. The more modern, and, and, and they've done research on this, and I'm not, I'm not gonna point out all, I'm not gonna bring up other research, not necessarily the point of this message, but as cultures get more modern, apart from Christ, they get more individually focused. And they get more focused on comfort and individual comfort. At, at um, the, uh, the de decrease of community. Modernism is the enemy of community. Modernism um, kind of breaks community up because it feeds so much into the individual. And there's some aspects of that that are, I suppose, are okay. But what it does is it, it, it steals this idea that we should maybe value others, um, that we should put their well-being ahead of our own desires. <laughs> I was actually praying over the, about this this morning. I'm like, because I never, I, I never want to purposefully, obviously, misrepresent God or his word. I never want to do that. And I know that I have in the past by misspeaking or not understanding something clearly and preach it and have to come back and sort of clean it up because so, I'm a fallible human being. So I know that. But I don't, want to, I don't want to do that. And so I just pray, God, if there's, if there's something I'm not getting right here, like, show me. And I... 
read my point number one here. Ask the Holy Spirit to help you put the well-being of others ahead of your own desires. Because that's what Philippians 2, verse 4 says, 3 and 4. I felt like the Holy Spirit said, notice, is, is not, you're not, notice you're not saying, and this is good, put the well-being of others ahead of your own well-being. God is not saying that. Right? So do not take that. God is not saying put the well-being of others ahead of your own well-being. Like how can you help others if you can't, if you're a, a mess, right? Like the, you've heard the, the thing put in the airline, um, if the oxygen masks drop and you've got kids, put yours on first, right? You've always heard that. That's been like in a thousand sermon illustrations. Put your mask on, put them on the kids, right? Got that. We're not talking about sacrificing your well-being for the well-being of others. We're talking about sacrificing desires for the well-being of others. Jesus totally did that. It's called picking up your cross. Remember Jesus said, you can't be my disciple unless you pick up your cross and follow me. Well, what does that mean? Again, this is not the purpose of, of this message, but you do not obviously have to be crucified physically on a cross for your sins because Jesus did that for you. So what does it mean to pick up your own cross? What it means is that you're not, you're gonna have to crucify some of your desires. Like, I really, really, really wanna do that. And, and you, can, you can have a lot of desires. You can do, you can live a grateful life, all right? So I'm not saying that. But if you're out to fulfill every one of your desires, it will affect, it will keep you from considering the well-being of others. It's, I'm, I'm telling you, this is challenging, this is hard, and I'm preaching to myself. Because this is a hard thing to do, but it's so, so valuable. That's part of working out your salvation, is understanding like, I could do this, and I would love to do this, but if I do this, it's really going to help this person or help these people. You can't... There's uh, so many caveats. You can't run yourself ragged. You can't run yourself down, right? One of the pastors taught me, he's like, when you really get this, and I'm so glad I learned this long ago, he said, he, said, he was talking to, to young pastors, and he said, you need to learn to step over the bodies. <laughs> In other words, you can't, you can't fulfill every need, all right? Just, just know that. You cannot fulfill every need you see. Once you start looking at the needs of others, it will get overwhelming. And God doesn't want you to be overwhelmed, but he wants you to, he wants you to minister out of calling, not out of need. Because there's always need. There's too much need. I feel like I'm getting into a whole other sermon, but I feel like I need to go here for just a minute. If you, tr if you really take this to heart more than God really intends it, you could run yourself ragged. And you could, you could run yourself down and not be good to anybody. Like, oh, I gotta help them. They got a need, they got a need, they got a need, they got a need. Like, no. God, of all these needs, what are you calling me to do? Who do I help here? And it's hard. It's hard to step over the bodies. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? That's meta a metaphor. It's hard to step over a need that seems so obvious to go to another need. Like, well, no, I need to do this one first, and then I'll get to you. Like, you can't do that. It's like, Holy Spirit, what do I need to do? Who am I going to? Because the need is too great. Hope that helps somebody. Um, so, but you're going to have to ask the Holy Spirit to help you do this. Can't do it on your own. Number two, application. Ask the Holy Spirit to give you the desire to accomplish the work God has planned for you. Kind of talked about desire earlier, but again, the application part of it is ask the Holy Spirit. Psalm 37, 4 says, Take delight in the Lord and he will give you the desires of your heart. I remember first reading that and thinking... Now, that couldn't mean he gives us whatever we want. Because if you read that, that's kind of what it, it looks like, right? Take delight in the Lord, and he'll give you whatever you want. I mean, it means that, but it doesn't mean it the way that you mean it. <laughs> or think it means, think you mean it. It does not mean whatever you want, he's going to give you. 
What it means is, God, I want my desires to be your desires. And that's what that verse means. When you delight in the Lord, when you connect with God through worship and prayer and, and teaching and summer Bible camp and all that stuff, the more you connect with God, the more his desires become your desires. And that's what really this, this says, is like when you do that, your desires begin to change. Your appetites begin to change. I started pastoring when I was... I guess, 40 years old, called the pastor a few years before that. But I remember when God called me to be a pastor in my later 30s and battled with him over that for a few days. But when I finally like, okay, I, I'm going to be obedient. I'm going to do it. I'm like, no, I, I'm going to be a pastor. That means people should get saved. Which I knew, I, I knew at that point salvation was important. I had experienced it, obviously. And I appreciated it. And it's always like nice to hear when other people get saved. Um, but did I have, a, I, I, honestly, I couldn't say I had a burden for unsaved people. But like, I can't, how can I pastor if I don't have a burden for unsaved people? I'm just being transparent. I mean, I wish I would have had it, but I, I'm just telling you, I just, I didn't. I, I thought it was cool, loved to see it, but wouldn't say I had a burden for it. And so I just asked the Holy Spirit, Holy Spirit, would you give me a burden for the lost? And he did. He did. It's amazing. When you ask God to give you his desires, he will do it. It'll change your appetites. It's also going to change a little bit of your lifestyle because kind of going back to the previous point, oh man, now my desire to do this is competing with my desire to do that. <laughs> and I really want to do that, but I really kind of want to do this too. So you, start to, you got to start working that out. That's working out your salvation, right? With fear and trembling. That's part of that. It's an ongoing process. So here's number three, application. Release the power of God that resides within you to accomplish his purposes. You can't do this on your own. We talked about that. You, you don't have enough <laughs> natural energy, power, wisdom. I mean, you've got all that in the natural, but you don't have enough really honestly to do what God's asking you to do to fulfill his purposes. So you need to ask God um, to release that. And here's the cool part. I, I didn't say ask God to give it to you because it already resides in you. If you were a believer in Jesus Christ, if you have accepted Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, not by works, right? But by faith, and by his grace, Jesus says, the moment you do that, Jesus says, I come to live in you, right? Doesn't Jesus say that? I live in you and you live in me. It's true. So Jesus lives in you. The Bible also says that all the fullness of God, the Father, dwells in Jesus. So if all the fullness of God dwells in Jesus and Jesus dwells in you, where's all the power of God? in you. Okay. <laughs> Don't hear what you think I might have said. I did not say that you're God and you have all his power. You are not God. And without his power, you don't have, you're not, not close enough to enough power. The power of God already is in there because God is in you. You just need to release it. You need to step out in faith. Turn on that valve of faith and release the power of heaven to this spot on earth. That's when stuff gets done. The church is the hope of the world because Jesus is the hope of the world. I know it's hard to think about the church being the hope of the world because it's got so many flaws because it's full of flawed people, 
like me and you, but it's still, it's still God's temple. It's his way, and he empowers imperfect and flawed people to carry out his perfect plan, and it happens when we participate with him. That's why, that's why we as the church are the hope of the world because Jesus is the hope of the world and we're his hands and feet. We're his body on this earth. We're his representers on this earth. And you are the church. Why don't you stand as we close this morning. I want to pray. We're going to have our prayer people come on up too as we close in a time of worship I just uh, really implore you to ask the Holy Spirit to give you the desires of the Father to give you his desires that they become your desires and that you could put some of your desires to the side to attend to the well-being of others whose lives or situations don't look really like heaven would look like. They look like kind of a messy spot on earth. Ask the Holy Spirit to give you the right motivation and let his power flow in you and through you as you minister to those around you. Let's just receive that prayer and I want to pray that for you. Holy Spirit, in the name of Jesus, I pray right now for every person here that you, you would give all of us, all of us, the right motivation as citizens of the kingdom of heaven that we would work out our salvation in the way you want us to work it out. We would fulfill your purposes. We would do the work of the kingdom. We would do the work of a good citizen. Not for the basis, not as a basis of our salvation, but as evidence of it and because of it. Lord, we are, we are so thankful for salvation. <laughs> we are thankful that we're saved from hell and we're gonna be with you in a perfect place forever. But Lord, for now on this spot on earth, salvation means we're advancing your kingdom. We're working out our salvation with fear and trembling because we fear you, Lord, with a proper fear, awe and reverence. So now, Holy Spirit, let your power flow in us and through us as we work in your kingdom as productive citizens. We ask in Jesus' name, amen. Come on up for prayer as we continue in worship.